told flood evacuees to maintain hygiene and avoid diseases. New COVID-19 infections rise to over 3,000. And thanks for joining us. You're watching News at 10 with me, Mohamed Amin Carlos. Well, more residents have been evacuated due to the floods in Trungano and Kelantan, while the situation in Pahang and Johor appear to be improving with a minor drop in the number of evacuees. Well, so far, a total of 417 temporary relief centers, or PBS, are currently in operation nationwide to accommodate 41,355 individuals evacuated from their homes. Well, according to the Welfare Department Disaster Info Portal, the number of evacuees in Trungano increased to 9,700 as at 7 p.m. from 5,000. 243 earlier today. Well, four districts in the state are affected with Kamaman being the worst hit area as 8,165 individuals placed at 25 PPS. And over in Klantan, the number of residents evacuated to relief centers rose to 5,538 as compared to 4,829 this morning. And Kuala Krai recorded the highest number of evacuees at 2,719, followed by Pasir Mas at 1,224. In Pahang, the number of residents seeking shelter at 278 relief centers in nine districts has slightly dropped to 24,107 people as at 7 p.m. The majority of the evacuees are those living in Tamarlo district where 59 PPS were open to house 7,107 people. Meanwhile, the flood situation in Johor has improved with 1,459 evacuees from 380 families are currently staying at 17 relief centers. This is a drop from the 2,313 residents from 575 families earlier today. Young Dibutuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah reiterated in Al Mustafa Bilashah took to the skies and boarded the EC-725 helicopter of the Royal Malaysian Air Force in order to observe the flood situation in Pahang. His Majesty departed from the Kuantan Air Base at 9 a.m. this morning and was accompanied by Munshi Basar, Dr. Sri Wan Rosli, Wan Ismail. And according to a statement released by Isana Negara, Al-Sultan Abdullah arrived in Kuala Lipis to visit flood evacuees at two temporary relief centers at Sekolah Kabangsa and Clifford and Sekolah Janis Kabangsa and China Chonghua. The king then visited other affected residents in Mentakab and Tamerlo at Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Mentakab and Dewan Majlis Perbandaran Tamerlo. His Majesty also consented to present donations to the flood evacuees who are seeking shelter at the relief centers. Meanwhile, Al Sultan Abdullah reminded the evacuees who are currently being placed at the relief centers to take care of their personal hygiene and cleanliness of the surroundings in order to avoid any diseases or illnesses. <laughs> Kerana kita bimbang, dia akan menjadi satu lagi uh, penyakit ataupun yang boleh berlewasa uh, nanti. Dan kita tidak mahu adanya virus baru ataupun penyakit baru uh, terdapat di di di, di negeri Pahang ini. Al Sultan Abdullah said this when visiting the flood evacuees at Sekolah Kebangsaan Clifford and Sekolah Jenis Kebangsaan China Chonghua in Kuala Lipis. Well, residents in Kampung Lecha, Raub, and the surrounding areas can breathe a sigh of relief as the temporary bridge connecting the village and the nearest Uludong town is being installed to replace the one that collapsed due to flood last Sunday. Well, the temporary bridge is expected to be ready for use tonight. 
The insulation of the compact Bailey 200 bridge, measuring 26 meters long and 7.35 meters wide, involved a team of military personnel from the Royal Army Engineers Regiment, RAJD. Senior Minister for Security, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, said the bridge can hold a maximum weight of 60 tons and it will be used until a new and permanent one is built. Ini saya bincang dengan uh, jurutera daerah JKR tadi. Uh, jangkaan untuk jambatan baru kekal ni dijangka akan boleh disiapkan dalam masa uh, 8 bulan hingga 12 bulan. Jadi sel sebelum selagi jambatan baru tidak siap, maka jambatan Beli lah yang akan digunakan oleh penduduk di kampung. On another development, the senior minister said the Malaysian armed forces were in a state of preparedness during this monsoon season and about 5,000 military personnel and various types of assets including boats and helicopters had been mobilized so far to help the victims in the flood hit areas. Telecommunication service providers or telcos are implementing disaster recovery plans to avoid prolonged service disruption in flood affected areas to ensure stable services for the people. Well, according to the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, the MCMC, the initiatives were taken as several areas recently experienced service disruptions due to power outages at communication towers. Well, in a statement, MCMC said the recovery plans include placing the generator on an elevated platform using a temporary or permanent generator and providing a temporary base transceiver station at the temporary relief centers. Well, members of the public are advised to save on the use of communication equipment in the event of a power outage and only use the device for important matters such as making emergency calls. MCMC also said that the people should contact the telecommunication companies if there are any service disruptions in their area to enable restoration works to be carried out. Well, all government agencies that are involved in the flood disaster management have sufficient assets to assist the affected residents in the country. Minister and Prime Minister's Department, Dato Sri Mohammad Redzwan Mad Yusuf, said the related organizations are always ready to mobilize the assets, especially in the event of unexpected disasters. Explaining further, he said agencies which include the National Disaster Management Agency and Fire and Rescue Department are always prepared for the worst, even though the natural disasters may bring about challenges for them to perform their tasks. Kita telah buat persediaan, tetapi yang berlaku bukannya yang kita anggap. Tetapi dari segi penggunaan aset itu, kita konsolidatkan semua. Di mana-mana yang kita dah siapkan, yang tak pakai kita bawa ke sini. Speaking after visiting two relief centers in Raub, he explained that the government's initiative to help the affected residents will continue through continuous monitoring and feedback that are received from the evacuees. Kelantan police will be issuing a 1,000 ringgit compound immediately against those who are found playing with floodwaters in a group as it violates the standard operating procedure or SOPs for COVID-19. Well, State Police Chief Dato Shafian Mamad said the move was an effort to break the chain of COVID-19 infection and part of precaution as the water level in the state has shown rising trends. Dato Safian said the issuance of such compounds was made under Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Regulations 2020 Act 324. Saya dah cakap tadi, nasihat dah habis sebenarnya. Habis tak makan nasihat dah ni, kita ambil tindakan. Habis. Itu sebab kalau hari ni kita tengok tindakan kompaun di Kelantan ni uh, melebihi daripada yang dulu. Tak kurang daripada 20 ke 30 kes satu hari. Jadi mana tidak ada nasihat dulu kan dalam 7 8 kes, sekarang tidak ada nasihat lagi. Ha, Mana-mana polis saya yang keluar ni itu utama ada perangkat pegawai dibekalkan dengan buku compound. Jadi siapa tak patuh, siapa tak ni, kita akan isu compound. He was met after observing flood situations around Kampung Tikat, Penambang and Kuala Besar, Pantai Cahaya Bulan, Kota Baru. Residents also have been advised to evacuate their houses to prevent any untoward incident.
CADA will increase enforcement and closely monitor the standard operating procedure or SOP compliance among passengers of the Linkawi ferry services to curb the spread of COVID-19. Majib Basam Mohamed Sanusi Madnor said the matter needs to be given serious attention because there were reports of non-compliance with the SOP among ferry passengers, including removing their face masks while they were using the service. The Manchibasa said the problem arises when there is no enforcement to monitor the SOP compliance in the ferries. Ferry kena kena di beri perhatian serius lah. Bila orang naik ferry ni dia di tangga face mask dia duduk. Saya dah minta ISCO untuk beri perhatian lah untuk kita patuh SOP dan Kementerian Pengangkutan Pengangkutan ada SOP tentang pengangkutan awam khususnya ferry. Benar-benar ni kena dikuat kuasa ni. The Menteri Bazaar was speaking after the launch of Embracing New Norms campaign at the state level in Dataran Wisma Darulaman, where Kadar football squad captain Badrul Bhaktia has been appointed as the icon for embracing new norms in Kadar. Well, seven days into 2021, Malaysia has once again broken the record of new daily COVID-19 cases, with 3,027 new infections registered today. In a statement, the Health Director General Tantri Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah said the figures have brought up the total cases recorded since February 2020 to 128,465 cases. Well, Tantri Dr. Noor Hisham added that from the total number of new cases reported, 3,021 were local transmissions, while six were imported. Johor took the top spot as the highest number of cases recorded by state with 1,103 cases, followed by 706 cases in Slango and 493 cases in Sabah. Tansri Dr. Noor Hisham said the active cases in the country so far stand at 25,742 after another 2,145 patients discharged in the last 24 hours, thus bringing the total recoveries to 102,723 cases. 142 patients are currently receiving treatments in the intensive care unit, where 63 of them require respiratory aid. The health DG also reported eight new deaths related to the virus reported, making the total casualties so far to 521 deaths. Meanwhile, in another statement on his Twitter account earlier today, Tansri Dr. Noor Hisham has warned that daily cases of COVID-19 might hit the 8,000 mark by March if the basic reproduction number of the R0 increases from 1.1 to 1.2. His officers remanded over meat cartel scandal. The Employees Provident Fund EPF has approved 2.5 million out of the 3.88 million applications for ICNAR under Category 1. It involves withdrawals totaling 19.62 billion ringgit as at 4th January. Well, in a statement, EPF said the first month's payout amounting to 10.07 billion ringgit would be made in stages beginning 5th of January. It said majority of the remaining 1.4 million submissions which have yet to be approved falls under the criteria outlined under Category 2, which will open for submissions from 11th January. So members who fall under Category 2 are advised to start preparing relevant documents such as official pay slips and bank statements for uploading on iSINA online. EPF said 701 applications were not approved due to various reasons such as non-matching of bank account numbers, applications made on behalf of deceased members or members being able to make total withdrawals from account 1 under the existing 55 years old facility. The EPF also assured members that the fund has put in place measures to prevent irresponsible third parties or scammers from making fake submissions. It said EPF strongly advised its members to avoid sharing photos or documents of their ICNR submissions or withdrawals on social media as this would expose them to potential scams and fraudsters. Well, the East Coast Rail Line ECRL project is the key for Malaysia to develop the country as a whole, specifically the East Coast region. And according to UITM's Technology and Supply Chain Management Department lecturer, Associate Professor Dr. Harlina Susanna Jafar, the ECRL will also improve connectivity and transportation system of the areas involved, which indirectly simulates domestic economy growth. 
Associate Professor Dr. Harina said the implementation of the project is important due to lack of alternative routes to access the East Coast region, adding that it will also offer shipment services which will benefit businesses in the area connected by the rail line. Keadaan sekarang, pengkutan barang ke pantai timur hanyalah melalui pengkutan jalan raya sahaja. Ya. Jadi dia amat terhad ya, jika diangkut melalui uh, lori dan juga trailer. Ya. Uh, dan juga kita sedia maklum bahawa kesesakan di, di pantai timur amat ketara. The Kuala Lumpur High Court today issued a stern warning to Dato Sri Najib Tun Razak to not repeat the virtual attack on former Bank Negara Governor Tan Sri Dr. Zeti Aksharazis. Justice Colin Lawrence Sequeira in making the ruling said the Pakan MP must stop making any statements relating to the 1MDB trials as if the trial is conducted in the public domain. Well, Justice Sukera added that necessary action will be taken against Dr. Sri Najib to protect the court's integrity. Well, the warning was issued following the request made by prosecution to impose warning on Dr. Sri Najib regarding statement posted on his social media platform about Tan Sri Dr. Zeti, who is also one of the witnesses for 1MDB trial. Defence counsel Tan Sri Shafi Abdullah said the post was made by the former Premier as a response to two online articles written by the former Bank Negara Governor. Deputy Public Prosecutor Ahmad Akram Garib, however, refuted Tan Sri Shafi by saying that no elements in the articles were found to be personal attacks towards Dr. Sri Najib. The trial will resume on 8th February. Well, two officers from the Johor's Malaysian Quarantine and Inspection Services Department, or MAKIS, were remanded for five days beginning today to assist in the investigation of the frozen meat cartel case. An assistant registrar, Nur Izati Mohamed Zahari, issued the remand order after allowing the remand applications by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, the MACC. While the two suspects, aged 27 and 31 years old respectively, will be further investigated under Section 17, Subsection A of the MACC Act 2009, during the remand period. Well, both of them who were stationed at the port of Tanjung Pelopas Gelangpata in Iskandar Putri were detained at the state MACC headquarters at about 11 p.m. last night for allegedly accepting bribes for their smuggling activities. But previously, Makis unearthed the cartel's activities which placed fake halal logos on their imported meat for sale in the local market. Well, meanwhile, four other individuals comprising three company directors and a clerk who were also remanded in connection with the same scandal were released on MACC bail of 10,000 ringgit each after their remand periods ended today. The suspects aged between 39 and 50 were prior to this remanded for four days by the Johor Bahru Magistrates Court. An Indonesian boat skipper was sentenced to two years and nine months in prison by the Johor Bahru High Court for being involved in migrant smuggling activities in July last year. Well, the accused, Sutiawan Bhaktia, aged 35, pleaded guilty after the charge was read before Judge Dr. Shahnaz Sulaiman. Well, on 7 July last year, the accused, together with another Indonesian woman, were arrested by the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency while they were trying to breach the country's border in Tanjong Piai, Johor. A fiber boat which was used to carry out the smuggling activities has been seized and was handed over to the Malaysian government. The accused was charged under Section 26, Subsection J of the Anti-Trafficking in Persons and Anti-Smuggling of Migrants Act, or ATIPSOM, 2007, while the prosecution was managed by the Deputy Public Prosecutor, Shazana Abdullajis. Multiple robberies and grand theft auto cases in Kulim Kedah were put to a stop following the arrest of 15 members of Gang Pali, Gang Paksu, and Gang Susang since December 2020. And Kulim Police Chief Superintendent Azhar Hashim said the police believe these suspects are responsible for 30 robberies and grand theft auto reported in the district since November last year. Well, Superintendent Azhar said during the first raid, which was conducted on 23rd December, well, police managed to apprehend two men aged 26 and 28 years old. Investigations revealed that one of them is the leader of Gang Pali, which then led to the arrest of another man in the early 20s. And police managed to solve 10 grand theft auto cases and five street robbery cases with the apprehension. In another raid on 27 December, nine members of Gang Pasu, aged between 19 to 35, 
five were detained in two separate operations. The gang was allegedly involved in five robbery cases in the surrounding area of Padang Sarai and Kabong Karangan. On 5th January, police managed to apprehend three gang Susang members for 10 mugging cases targeting female immigrants. Police is currently on the hunt for the gang leader. Investigation revealed that all the suspects used the gains from their criminal activities to purchase drugs. Well, all of the cases are being investigated under Section 395 and 397 and 379A of the Penal Code. Indonesia to issue edict on vaccine use. That and more in our foreign segment. The foreign news, while well, Indonesia's highest Muslim clerical council aims to issue a ruling on whether a COVID-19 vaccine is halal or permissible under Islam before the country is due to start a mass inoculation program using a Chinese vaccine next week. While well, the world's largest Muslim-majority country plans to launch vaccinations on 13 January after obtaining 3 million doses from China's Sinovac biotech as initial clinical tests have concluded. The country is now waiting for the country's food and Drug Agency, or BPOM, to issue emergency use approval for vaccinations to start. Controversy over whether vaccines adhere to Islamic principles have stymied public health responses before, including in 2018 when the Indonesian Ulama Council, or MUI, issued a fatwa, or edict, declaring that a measles vaccine was forbidden under Islam. Nevertheless, several residents in Depok, a city in West Java province, said that they would be fine with using the vaccine under an emergency, even it contained non-halal substances. Indonesia is struggling with the worst COVID-19 outbreak in Southeast Asia and authorities are relying on a vaccine to help alleviate dual health and economic crisis ravaging the country. Well, Japan has declared a limited state of emergency in the capital Tokyo and three neighboring prefectures to stem the spread of the coronavirus, hoping that less stringent curbs than imposed earlier will this time stamp out infections. Well, the government said the one-month emergency would run from Friday until 7 February in Tokyo and Saitama, Kanagawa and Chiba prefectures, covering about 30% of the country's population. But restrictions would center combating transmission in bars and restaurants, which the government says are main risk areas. Its Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga's government is seeking to limit damage to the world's third biggest economy while striving to defeat the virus once and for all as it looks ahead to staging the postponed Summer Olympics. Well, Japan, though less seriously hit by the pandemic than many places, has been unable to rein in the virus to the extent some countries in the region have, with a new daily tally of more than 7,000 for the first time on Thursday. Overall, Japan has seen 267,000 cases and nearly 3,000 deaths. Well, violent protests at the U.S. Capitol today have left several dead and resulted in dozens of arrests after supporters of outgoing President Donald Trump stormed the Capitol building in chaotic scenes. Well, according to Washington, D.C. police, four were killed and 52 arrested after law enforcement officers confronted protesters who breached the Capitol. A rough estimate of up to 30,000 Trump supporters had earlier gathered to hear a rally by the Republican incumbent, with large numbers later marching towards the Capitol and many seen breaking into the building. The violent intrusion forced electoral vote counting to certify President-elect Joe Biden's victory in the 2020 election to be halted and led to members of Congress being taken to a secure location. Other lawmakers were evacuated from the House and the Senate as protesters forced their way into the building and entered the chambers. As safety concerns grew, law enforcement agencies such as the FBI and Maryland National Guard were called in to maintain order. Shops located nearby were boarded up with planks amid fears of increasing violence. The protesters destroyed blockades around the Capitol, with some scaling the high wall outside the building. 
Almost no one was wearing face masks, despite the U.S. leading the world in confirmed COVID-19 cases and deaths related to the disease. Trump has continually refused to acknowledge defeat in the 2020 presidential race with Biden and is still pushing claims of a fraudulent election, which has been dismissed by U.S. courts at different levels due to a profound lack of evidence. Sports, Man City beat United in Derby to reach Cup Final. Well, Manchester City reached their fourth straight League Cup Final as second-half goals from John Stones and Fernandinho gave Pep Guardiola's side a 2-0 win over Manchester United in the semi-final at Old Trafford early this morning. Well, City will meet Jose Mourinho's Tottenham Hotspur at Wembley in the 25th April final as they seek their fourth League Cup triumph in a row. In a frantic opening to the game, both teams had efforts ruled out for offside. Kevin De Bruyne then struck the post with a thundering drive from outside the box before Foden also put the ball in the net for City, but the visitors were foiled by offside once again. It was an open and entertaining game with City, looking sharper but United competitive as they sought revenge for last year's defeat by their neighbours at the same stage of the competition. City went ahead five minutes after the break when Foden whipped in a free kick from the left through a crowded box and defender Stones bundled across home at the back post of the ball going in off his thigh. United keeper Dean Henderson produced a brilliant save to tip over a strike from Briad Mahrez after the Algerian had burst forward from the halfway line. Fernandinho made sure of the win seven minutes from time with a stunning volley as he pounced on a headed clearance from Aaron Juan Bissaka. Well, Turkish media has reported that Fenerbahce will sign German midfielder Mesut Ozil from Arsenal for three and a half years for an undisclosed fee. Well, there was no immediate comment on the reports from Fenerbahce, well, it was reported that Ozil and the club had agreed on the transfer in principle and that the 32-year-old would join the former Turkish champions later in this transfer season. Fenerbahce chairman Ali Koch said previously that signing Ozil, who has Turkish ancestry, was a nice dream for the club, who have suffered from financial woes in recent years. Koch had said Fenerbahce would need to offload players to make any transfers in January. Ozil fueled rumors about a move to Fenerbahce with an Instagram post about Istanbul on Tuesday. The German has not played for Arsenal since March 2020 and was not named in the squad list for the first half of the current Premier League season. Ozil who is one of the highest paid players at Arsenal is out of contract at the end of the season but the club is looking to offload players in January to trim the squad. Last week Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta had said the club would wait for the January transfer window to make a final call about the German nationals fate. Arsenal are currently 11th in the standings on 23 points while Fenerbahce are 5th in Turkey's top tier Super League on 29 points with two behind league leaders Gaziantep. Well, that concludes News at 10 in our top story. Agong told flood evacuees to maintain hygiene and avoid diseases. Join us again for more updates at 12.30 p.m. tomorrow on TV2. Thanks for watching. I'm Mohamed Amin Carlos. Stay tuned to Saloran Brita RTM and have a pleasant night ahead. Bye for now.